Yeah, these large black bats here are the Livingston's fruit bats and they come from the Comoro Islands which are at the top of the Mozambique Channel between Madagascar and Africa. They're really quite unique, the Livingston's fruit bat, because they're, they're at jet black, they've got these large sort of orange eyes and they've got these big Mickey Mouse rounded ears. They're the only fruit bats that have these nice big rounded ears like that. They are incredibly inquisitive bats, very forward, very, very intelligent. It's amazing how they actually use, they use a pendulum to want to get him. And so they, very, very intelligent animals. What I'm going to do, I'm going to fox him. The Livingston's fruit bat is in a, such a precarious situation in the wild, the numbers have dropped so low, that we decided that we'd start this um, conservation safety net population. The species was so rare, I think it was thought to be extinct in the 80s. And in the late 80s, it was a guy from Reading University who went out there and sort of rediscovered the Livingston's fruit bat. The Livingston's fruit bat, or the Comoros black flying fox, was named after Dr. Livingston, who described them to Western science. And he found these roost sites, not many of them left, up in the mountains where the bats were. So you get them roosting high up. But also, I mean, if you think, if you're living in the tropics, it's very, very hot at midday. And a lot of tropical animals are either crepuscular or nocturnal in that sense, you know. There's only mad dogs and Englishmen who come out in the midday sun. So, you know, bats aren't going to be active in the temperatures of 35, 40 degrees because the camores are almost on the equator there. And you can see this um, chap here, very, very inquisitive because, like I said, they've got a fantastic sense of smell and I have a banana in one hand they can smell it and uh, in the wild they can smell ripe fruit from five kilometers away I and mean, that's incredible really so the areas that they will go and feed might be different every night depending on what trees are in in season but the roost sites that they go to are the same and the roost sites are really important because they're usually emergent large tree stands which are safe well, fruit bats are incredibly important for the health of the forest and for that reason they're called farmers of the forest and bats will carry fruit over longer distances than birds will and therefore they're spreading those seeds. Bats are fantastic pollinators of forest flowers so therefore you know a lot of these trees will not come into fruit unless they're pollinated and bats do, a, do an enormous amount of that so they're keystone species they're vital to those ecosystems and bats in general are incredibly important to us. Things like durian, which is a huge market fruit in Southeast Asia. Things like tequila you know, in uh, Mexico and places like that. That's totally dependent on a, a species of bat for its pollination. But also what you'll find in here is lots of plants that the bats have actually seeded themselves. So we get Cape gooseberries, we get uh, figs and in the, uh, later on in the year we'll get melons and tomatoes and of course the bats will come down and feed on those fruits fruits from the very plants that they've planted themselves and you can imagine this in in the wild we have a bat roost of some several hundred bats the influence in terms of seed dispersal and pollination that they have on that greater ecosystem is vast so that's why it's so important so if you take out that bat roost you're affecting a vast area of that ecosystem. In America alone, in terms of pest control, obviously a lot of it, bats are insect eating. There's an enormous amount of uh, pests that are eaten by bats. And uh, I think they've calculated it per year as a benefit of $50 billion to the US agricultural sector, which is enormous. If you go back in, you know, to the early 1900s, there, were, there used to be sort of malaria outbreaks in the southern states. And there was a Dr. Campbell who worked out that if he increased the number of bats in the area, the populations of mosquitoes would be massively depleted. So he would build these enormous bat houses, these bat hotels. And the local authorities realised this was a fantastic way of controlling the occurrence of malaria. We've created this height by digging out these valleys either side. So it's 40 meters that way and 40 meters this way and there's about uh, 10 meters in between so you've created this 100 meter loop 
and so you've got continuous flight. And since we've created this great big donut and this flight path, we've seen their health improve, their fitness improve, and crucially, their birth rate improve. And we're having lots of successful pups being born. So on the islands of the Comores, you've got the human population that's expanding quite rapidly. One of the things they'll go in, they'll move into the forest to chop areas down so they, they can plant some of their crops, but also to just to collect firewood for their stoves and things. At the moment, there's a, a, an NGO called Dahari. And Durrell and Bristol Zoological Society were instrumental in helping to set up this uh, NGO. Probably one of the most important things that they're doing is they're running agroforestry courses for the local people. So they're teaching them about the benefits of the forest. And if they carried on chopping down the forest at the same rate, basically their streams and rivers are going to dry out, as is what's happened in some of the other Pacific islands out there. So they need, obviously, the forest as the watersheds for those um, waterways. So they're teaching them techniques where they can, they can crop within the, the forest systems, but protect soils as well and increase their yields. And this is really, really important. So they're running these workshops and setting up demonstration plots, as well as replanting trees in key areas. They're restoring the habitat, but they're also improving the livelihoods of the local people. And then they become, the local people will become the champions for the bats and tell other people about the benefits of having a healthy ecosystem for their long-term survival on the island. I think the most important thing for people to realise is that bats are our friends. If we draw the analogy as an ecosystem around the world, as a blanket, that keeps us safe is the biosphere. And within that biosphere, animals like bats, they're the nuts and bolts that make that biosphere work. But what we've been doing is taking the nuts and bolts, unscrewing them and chucking them away. So the machine is starting to fail. And so if the machine fails, what's that going to do to us and our survival on island Earth? It's really important for us to look after our bats that we have on the island of Jersey. Not we're looking after the fruit bats here, but the species of bats that visit your gardens. So please, you know, make sure that you have lovely little wildlife areas in your garden, even if it's two square meters. Let the plants grow, bring the insects in. And if you want to come up and see the bats here, please do. They're fantastic animals.